Hello, everybody. That's our cue to get started here. I'm excited to see you all today. Thanks for joining us for this very important conversation around volunteer enrollment and engagement uh, from this past summer. I'm excited uh, to talk to you today and hear from our speaker, Barry Altlin, and um, just excited for you to meet him and also to hear about the survey results that you guys filled out over the summer around this topic. So I want to introduce to you Barry. He is uh, what I like to call a volunteer engagement and uh, specialist. I love the word specialist. Um, he has written a manual around working with volunteers, and he really does believe that in order to work with volunteers, you have to engage not only their head and what they want to do when they're volunteering in your organization, but their heart. Where's, where's their heart in their volunteering uh, opportunity with your camp and their hands? What is it that they want to do when they come to camp? So I'm going to turn the floor over to Barry and let him lead our conversation. Thanks, Barry. Yeah, what an honor it is to be with all of our uh, uh, our peers, our colleagues today within this community. And uh, Jennifer and I have been spending some time and getting to know each other over the last few months uh, leading up to our session today. Uh, I will set the stage by saying that this is going to be a highly interactive session. There are going to be a number of opportunities uh, for you to be, uh, have your voice heard. Uh, during the session today and uh, would be honored because that's how we learn. We learn together within this community. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is, is just touch upon some of those details that, um, that are part of that uh, survey that I'm hoping that many of you completed and you're anxious to be able to receive the results. There were 49 unique responses, 49 unique responses, which I think does provide st statistical validity, uh, hard words to say with my new braces from a couple months ago. And two out of three of uh, our camps or programs, we're doing overnight camp programming. So again, as I'm learning more about your community, I found this data insightful. And then one more detail that, uh, that sets the stage is that 84% of uh, our programs are renting their camping site. So again, just setting the stage, helping us to understand who were the respondents that uh, lent their voices in this survey. Now, you're going to see a trend right here over the last three prior years. Three out of four in 2020, if you remember the beginning of the pandemic timeframe, shifted to virtual camp. In the following year, 2021, you'll see that uh, the trend started going back to a bit more live. Only three out of seven engaged in virtual camp in 2021. And then in 2022, 80%, four out of five programs were back to in-person. So a very clear trend going back to where we, certainly I believe in it, I believe in it from a learning perspective and a volunteer engagement perspective that when we're able to be in the same room with others, that that provides the optimal experience. And so that's what I was gleaning from the, uh, the survey results. And then helping us to understand why we're all here together today and why we're, we're focusing on this topic of engagement is that Three out of four of the camps who responded said that they experienced lower camper registrations in 2022. Also three out of four said that they felt that COVID-19 was the reason for those lower registrations. Finally, as well, three out of four said that it has been more difficult for them to be able to attract staff and volunteers in this calendar year 2023. So this is the point where I'm going to stop for a moment and I'm going to invite our panelists, uh, Dr. Mike, uh, as well as Jennifer. Uh, but before we go to them, I would just love to hear 
from any of you, any thoughts or questions as we set the stage for our conversation today. And uh, I want this to be a highly interactive session. There are two easy ways to jump in. You can just give me a quick wave of the hand and I will spotlight your video. Or if you know how to use the, uh, the Zoom uh, digital hand raise, you're welcome to do that as well. But we just love to hear any initial thoughts from that introduction to the survey. Ah, Tanya, go ahead. Hi, uh, I guess nothing in it surprises me, which is good. Uh, and I guess it's also good that, that there are, uh, everybody is kind of in the same boat um, and ready to learn. Fantastic. Good thoughts. Who else would like to share? And I see something popped up in the chat right there. Maybe Kelly can help us out. And, and Dr. Mike, what, what are your thoughts, even as we just get introduced to the survey content? Well, I, I have to agree that uh, the things that people said were generally consistent with uh, my personal experience at our camp and also the things that I've heard from uh, other camps, both uh, special medical needs camps and in the camping world in general, there are probably a bunch of different reasons for that. Part of it has to do with a lingering fear about COVID and people's just not being used to going out uh, and doing things so much. It's going to take a little while to readjust to that. We missed those years when everybody was either not doing anything or being in a virtual setting to sort of lay the groundwork and make people be excited about coming back to volunteer because a large proportion at most coca camps of the staff are often returning campers when they age out and they want to come to to volunteer um, and so i think uh, those things have made it more difficult for people to uh, to commit um, to something. And then there's this other thing that you hear people talking about that, uh, and I think it's particularly true probably for those college age folks that we are primarily targeting, that when they were teenagers during COVID and sitting home alone, there are things that they really didn't learn about interacting with other people and being in person with people in a social setting that made them a little bit more maybe uncertain about whether they wanted to do it and uncertain about how to act if they did decide. Yeah, Dr. Mike, uh, you're, you're touching on something that is very close to my heart, only because in my full-time professional role, I work with collegiate aged students. And uh, I constantly remind them, remind myself that they, even though for us being a bit more seasoned in life, that the pandemic certainly was, was life changing, but yet it was still just another thing that happened in our life. It did not necessarily happen during a formative time frame in our lives. Uh, I, I remind myself that our, our young people really had two years of social, socialization robbed from them and, and uh, they're playing catch up now. And so, yeah, we're gonna dip into this and, and, and weave it into our conversation today to recognize that maybe, just maybe, serving in, in their communities or maybe serving in all of your camps can be part of that accelerated socialization process, something in which I, I deeply believe. So yeah, let's let's continue on with the conversation. Unless Callie, was there something that came in on the chat that's uh, worthy to share? Uh, Natalie just said she agreed. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Affirmation. We appreciate that. Very good. So as the survey was begging for your input, it really looked at two specific challenges. And then from there, uh, Jennifer gave me the opportunity to glean the results and, uh, and, and do an analysis on it. And what I did is I came up with seven response categories. So again, setting the stage, your two challenges, one was camper registration and engagement. And then the second of those two challenges was staff and volunteer attraction and engagement. And the seven response categories appeared as you see on the screen right here. I will not read them for you because we're going to touch upon each of them individually. And there are a few stories to be told within these results. So let's take a closer look at these seven response categories. 
Category number one, I put specifically at the beginning to remind us that on, on the camper registration and engagement side, and then also on the staff and volunteer attraction and engagement side of, of the survey items, that we had 14 unique responses that said, hey, we're good. We're not really facing any issues or challenges. Maybe, maybe somebody in the room uh, was part of one of those responses and is able to share their good news, share their model practices, and, and recognize that, that good things are actually happening uh, at your camps, which is a, an exciting place to be in, to be reminded that despite all of these challenges, that good things are still happening. With category number two, I labeled it volunteer traits and behaviors. And as you'll see on the left side, there really were not any responses specific to camper registration and engagement that noted this category, but yet specific to volunteer traits and behaviors. Of course, the one seven unique comments on lack of commitment or complacency, or, or shall I say, a perceived lack of commitment and complacency. And I'm emphasizing that because I want us to come back to it and explore a simple concept in leadership. Now, category number three, I labeled it logistics. And you'll see that many of our responses landed in this category, both in camper registration and engagement and in staff and volunteer attraction and engagement. So if you'll allow me to highlight a few of the numbers, uh, the new and returning registration, even though there were 41 mentions, it was really just reiterating the obvious that there were there's logistics challenges and general comments were made. More specifically, this is what I noted in on this slide is that under volunteer attraction, it appeared eight times in volunteer attraction, but it also was mentioned seven times as having an impact on camper registration. So volunteer attraction and engagement having an impact on camper registration. And I think that that's something that's important to note as we press a little bit deeper into our data. And then the fourth category of the seven categories is what I labeled as time related. And again, nothing really appeared on the camper registration side, but look at that, 26, 26 unique mentions on time off from their paid professional role could be an indicator of a number of things, but I'm interested in your input. What do you think drove such a high response in staff and volunteer engagement and attraction specific to time off, the challenge of getting time off from one's paid professional role? What's happening in our, in our sociology right now that has made that a significant challenge? Just curious to hear a voice. Oh, and again, Tanya, hello. <laughs> I'll talk. I mean, the only thing that popped to mind when you mentioned that was that I know a lot of people were able to get out and do things. Um, so they might have already used their professional time off for those personal things and no longer had their bank filled uh, that they could volunteer at camp. Ah, some good insight right there. Absolutely. How about others? What would you add to that? What were the challenges? Mark. Hi, Mark. I was wondering, I was thinking about what you said about the, or uh, what Dr. Um, Dr. Mike said about less volunteers that are kind of aging into that role from being campers. So then it would seem like if, if we're kind of missing out on that group that maybe we're more dependent on an older group that is moving more kind of into the professional world and has less flexibility in the summers than maybe they had when they were just kind of coming into those volunteer roles? That could be. And, and I, I say this with complete transparency, even though I mentioned that I do work with uh, college-aged um, students, mostly men. Uh, I will readily acknowledge from my experience in working with volunteers that every 
age group, and every generation brings its own unique challenges. Uh, and yet I still try to safeguard myself from lumping individuals into these broad generational categories. And I still try to emphasize that each of them within those generations is a unique individual that has their own likes and dislikes and, and experiences and skills and passions. And, and really try to remind us as leaders that that's where we need to focus. But it, it is a, a significant trend, Mark. Uh, and, and I like the way that you're thinking about it. 26 mentions, uh, that's that's a pretty big number. Pretty big number out of 40, 49 unique responses. Uh, Dr. Mike, what would you add? Well, I think, uh, I don't know how many of these fell into what category, but the other thing that is a little bit unique about COCA camps is that we need to recruit not only volunteer counselors and program staff for our programs, but we need to get medical professionals to be there serving their medical needs during the camp session. And COVID devastated the medical profession in many different ways. And so many hospitals are struggling with significant shortages of nurses in particular, but also docs. And so I can only imagine that it's probably even harder than it used to be. And it never has been very easy to get those people to give up a week of their uh, practice to come and help serve the kids at a summer camp. So I, I would think that that might be part of the problem there. And I think uh, perhaps um, our spectrum of people who volunteer in the context of co COCA camps is probably also uh, looks a little bit different from a demographic standpoint, even in the counseling and program side, that a lower percentage of our staff are college student volunteers who come for just a couple of years and then maybe disappear after they get married or move or get a job or whatever, that there are a lot of camps who have people who've been volunteering for decades and keep coming back. And they obviously, uh, during that time, have aged into a different demographic group. And I don't want to lump them in uh, any more than you do, but I do think that the demographic spectrum looks different for some of our, our camps and that perhaps uh, during the time when those kinds of summer activities were not available, they took on additional responsibilities or just got used to doing different kinds of things. I don't know, but that may have had an influence as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did have the blessing of reading every word that was typed <laughs> on this survey and just really soaking in the verbatim commentary. And, and you're right that I, even though this is an aggregated number, that there were a number of specific mentions of, of professionals who just could not break away. But also there was reference to volunteers who could not break away from their, their regular full-time gig to be able to serve even if they wanted to. You, just that life changed, life changed for them. So Jennifer, what, what additional thoughts might you add to the conversation? Uh, what Dr. Mike said, <laughs> for sure. I mean, yeah, you know, the, the whole purpose of us doing this survey, for those of you that weren't on the session last Tuesday where we talked about camper engagement and attraction and recruitment, um, this all started back in the spring, uh, started hearing little whispers from some of our camps in Canada and, and then also across the U.S. about difficulty in uh, engaging their volunteers again to come back to camp if it was their first time for in-person pr programs. And one of the things that uh, one of the camps in Canada told me was that their volunteers have just, they've moved on, you know, they've moved on to other things. Um, and, you know, as much as that camp, uh, it's unfortunate, they also recognize that it, this is going to happen, you know, and it happens, you know, usually very naturally from year to year anyway, with certain volunteers, but some of their longtime volunteers, it was their first time to go back and see family who they had not seen in several years. And they needed to take that vacation to go see those family members or 
they now have their own family and they have other responsibilities or the job um, that we've already talked about a lot was, um, you know, keeping them from, from volunteering. So that's why we wanted to collect this information. Um, and so we could have it to help us going into 2024 and figure out what do we need to do? Uh, and Jennifer, I'm going to use that as a, a beautiful segue into our next point, because anytime that we have a group of leaders in the room together, and I think of the Zoom room as, as an actual room, I, I like to take that opportunity to just share what I think is one of the most misunderstood aspects of leadership. And I think that all of you, uh, and, and I don't know you very well, and I don't know what roles you have, but yet I do think of you as a leader. So what I'm going to ask of you in this moment is if you have a handheld digital device nearby, uh, if you can grab it, and if we can use it, think of it as a research device in this moment. So pull up your search engine of choice. And I'm going to ask you to type into that search bar two types of motivation. Because I believe that this is such an important part. Some of you may already know this. Some of you may, may be experiencing this insight for the first time. But just take a moment, two types of motivation. And just read, just click on the first link or the second link that you see and just soak it in, give you about a minute. Go beyond just the words, dig deeper into the definitions. And then I wanna discuss. Provide another 30 seconds or so, continue to read. Two types of motivation. Some of you, you're probably doing a revisit to your college psychology classes. <laughs> For some, this would be maybe new words. Who would like to share what they discovered in their rapid research? And yes, it's perfectly acceptable to read right off of your screen in front of you if you wish. Who would like to do that? Let's hear a new voice, somebody who we have not heard yet. And even just give me a quick wave of the hand, would love to uh, include you. Beverly, is that a wave of the hand? No, I'm using a dinky little tablet because I'm on my way to the hospital for an event and I've got a few minutes that I can be in this meeting. Oh, all right. Well, but, yeah, it was I learned about internal and there. external and um, motivation. Yeah, keep going. Um, uh, well, I was just reading about, you know, the two different types of motivation. It totally resonates in my mind and in my engagement with others. Yeah, so, so hit us again with those two words. What are the two different types of motivation? Well, I just call them internal and external, but intrinsic and extrinsic. Yeah, and, and both of those uh, sets of terms work very, very well. Intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And again, who would like to jump in and share their their um their own version not maybe not the screen version but their own version their own understanding of the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation yes natalie hi hello um intrinsic is like your personal motivation so like if you find something that you like personally believe in like spiritually or religiously or whatever um you're like self-motivated 
whereas intrinsic is like someone asking or telling you to do something so like maybe someone's mom has signed them up to volunteer somewhere or their boss tells them they have to donate so many hours a week um so there is an external force telling them to do something ah, yes yeah that's a that's a great description and and the way that i i add to that natalie is uh, when, when i when i think of intrinsic motivation i think about what stirs in the hearts of, of each of us, which really dispels this notion. And I see it often in memes and, and other content where they say, well, this person's, they're just not motivated. They're unmotivated. And I say, that's simply not true. We're all motivated. They're all, we're all motivated by something. Something drives us from within. And, and I love being in live workshops where some brave soul will raise their hand and they'll say, well, yeah, what, what, what about the person who stays in bed all day? Are they motivated? And, and Natalie, how would you respond to that? I mean, they're probably motivated by certain things. They just might not have found it yet. Yeah, well, in that moment, they're motivated to stay in bed all day. So uh, there is something that's driving their decisions. And this is true for each and every one of us. So I, I, I just offer this opportunity for us to just find a bit more clarity from a leadership perspective on this understanding of motivation. So that is intrinsic motivation. And here's the way that I describe extrinsic motivation, that there is an effort that is being made by somebody else outside of us to get us to do what they would like us to do. And if you can just latch on to that simple explanation, you really begin to see the stark difference between these two types of motivation. And then I ask all of you, because you work with volunteers, where I think that the concept of motivation maybe plays itself out more lucidly than in any other environment. Which of these two types of motivation is more powerful in driving passionate performance? Is it intrinsic motivation or is it extrinsic motivation? Would love to hear somebody's thoughts on that. I'm very comfortable with silence. Tanya in the chat said Intr intrinsic. Okay, and that was that was whom? Tanya. Tanya. Oh, oh yes. Very good. Uh, you know. I agree. I agree with you. And it's such an important reminder for all of us in our leadership roles to, to just embrace that there is something that's going on in the hearts of every person, every staff member, every volunteer, every person who in any way engages with the work that you do. There is something that is compelling them, that is driving them to do that. Or in some cases, and Jennifer, you were mentioning this a few minutes ago, Maybe it's something that in this moment is compelling them to do something else instead. And, and I'm coming back to you, Dr. Mike, and to Jennifer. How do we find out? How do we know what stirs in the hearts of others? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, and I think that uh, if we're doing a good job of engaging those volunteers, both in the process of recruitment and kind of uh, screening the process that you put people through before you decide they're a good fit. Uh, one of the things that hopefully we gain from that is a better understanding of what their motivation is. Um, and, and I think that I would agree that the intrinsic motivation leads to a better quality of performance. But I think the strongest situation is when the two are in alignment. If we're trying to recruit someone to do something that they already kind of are uh, self-disposed uh, to want to do anyway, that's the magic combination. Yes, uh, I do love to reinforce that. <laughs> Extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation, they're connected and extrinsic factors can be highly effective, but only when they're aligned with something that's already important in our hearts. 
like uh, in the case I would imagine of many who uh, who you work closely with is that they, they've got uh, a heart for serving others and they likely have a story, a reason that connects them with the, the amazing work that you do. So uh, Jennifer, what additional thoughts would you share? Well, I was just going to share from the chat real quick. Beverly had said equal, and, I, and I'm assuming, Beverly, do you mean that both intrinsic and extrinsic are equal, kind of like Dr. Mike's explanation? She's giving us a thumbs up. Okay. And then Natalie mentions, although sometimes external can lead to internal. So extrinsic can lead to intrinsic. And then Darla mentions for students we recruit, it tends to be both with extrinsic, the weightier motivation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> interesting perspectives, interesting perspectives. Yeah, and, and we could probably launch into a deep discussion on just that topic alone. I don't wanna sidetrack us from, from uh, this important work of continuing to touch on, on these, these points that, that have arisen from the survey data. But I just think it's important that we emphasize this concept of motivation so that you're clear in your understanding of those two very distinctly different types. Let's, let's take a look at category number five, where you're going to begin to see much uh, a more frequent responses appear under the category of requirements. And that is the, the, the label that I gave it in this broader category right here. And you'll, you're going to see on that top line, 31 unique responses to medical requirements or vaccine requirements. I can guarantee you we're not going to solve that one during our time together today. So let's, Let's agree to just move beyond that, but I still felt it important to include it in the data right here to acknowledge the voice of those who responded. But more specifically, I would love to focus on the touch of attracting qualified professionals and the challenges that are inherent, as well as a need for male staff and male volunteers. There were a total of eight mentions specific to male volunteers and male staff members, which I, I was pleased. I was pleased to see that. And what I'd like for us to do is jump into some quick breakout rooms and let's have some small group discussion. As soon as you land, as soon as you accept the invitation into your breakout room, what I'll encourage you to do, somebody either self-nominate or nominate somebody else who feels comfortable in being a note taker Please be a note taker, capture any of the highlights from your conversation, and then be prepared to be the spokesperson as well. We'll come back out and we'll do a debrief, but I would really just looking for any model practices that your organization implements, or maybe it's just some further questions that you would like to explore specific to attracting qualified professionals or a need for male staff and male volunteers. So give me just a moment while I set up the breakout rooms. And uh, we will include our co-hosts. So Dr. Mike and Jennifer, and also Kelly, if you're thrown in there, uh, please feel free to jump into those small group conversations and accept your invite at this time.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. Give me a wave if you're uh, if you were one of the spokes people or uh, the note takers for your group. I see Natalie right there. Very good. Very good. I have to uh, reestablish our uh, our spotlights. Natalie, uh, share what your group talked about during your breakout session. Yeah, so um, I think everyone agreed that it's harder to find males, especially after the pandemic, um, and that kind of word of mouth is the easiest um, and most effective way to get male or male identifying counselors. Um, and it seemed like across the board that uh, our camps have been putting some female staff with younger males to try and fill in some of those gaps. Um, and that uh, even like finding medical, uh, male medical staff is more trickier. Um, so like there are a few male nurses and physicians and stuff, um, but most of them are, are females that are, are female identifying that are coming to camp. Um, and that, but a lot of us have like changed ratios um, and had to, you know, kind of fill in gaps or only had as limited as possible staffing ratios with the male cabins, especially the older ones, um, as not every female wants to to jump into those situations. Um, so just overall tricky to get the staff and ratios needed to be like as perfect as we want to be. <laughs> Great, sounds like some really rich discussion right there. Who else from one of the other two breakout groups will add to uh, to Natalie's uh, insights? Who are other two uh, note takers? Mark, hi Mark. Well, yeah, we, we our conversation got a little, um headed in a different direction as we we were talking about the age at which we allow um, people to apply. And and uh, one of the members of our group talked about how they have a an age limit of 21 years old, that you have to be 21 or above, and that um, they found that that helped to reduce some um, some issues that came about with, with some younger, maybe less mature volunteers. And then there were a couple other members of our breakout group that talked about taking more of a case by case basis with, you know, 18 year olds, 19 year olds and um, not having a, a blanket yes or no. Uh, and we were just about to crack the code of, of, of attracting male leaders. Uh, I could feel it coming, but we ran out of time right, right as we were about to really dig into the, that question. So. And, and Mark, uh, I just emphasize for the group, all learning is good. So it matters not the direction that you took the conversation. And it, it's interesting, if you'll allow me to just share a personal thought that my wife and I uh, were exploring on, on the way home from my softball game last night. That reinforces something that you just mentioned, that, that may be uh, loosening the ways that we think about age requirements uh, may be beneficial uh, to be able to help us serve others at our best is uh, there is a son of a, a fellow teammate of mine. And this son, this young man is still in high school and he's playing baseball on the local uh, high school baseball team. I believe he's 16. And we have welcomed him on this adult softball team and to watch him learn and to interact with the men, some, some players as old as 57 years old uh, on this team, uh, it, it's a real joy to watch him interact. But yet my wife and I were having this conversation and honoring that we have a nephew who has already graduated high school. He's 19 years old. And yet we were having difficulty imagining him interacting with a team of men in the same way. So it, it was just one of those moments from my own personal life that reminded me that maybe just that number, just the age number alone is not the only indicator that we have of one's abilities. And, uh, and, and you know, revisiting those guidelines, uh, if, if your organization has that capacity, uh, there, there might be some value to it. So I'm, I was glad to hear that your group mentioned. 
And who else from the third group has anything additional to share? Sure. So we, I don't think we named a spokesperson, but I will speak. Um, we definitely spoke about, you know, similar things to everyone in terms of really struggling even before COVID and then exacerbated post COVID with uh, both male and kind of qualified in terms of really the only new people coming in are very young and inexperienced. Um, and we also spoke about how we had kind of at the one end, the much younger and inexperienced group kind of lost that middle group. And then the rest are ones who've been here for years, like the ones that have stuck around um, and trying to make sure we're bridging that gap one so that they're teaching the new people and including them, but also that the people who've been around for so long are now aging up. And so their networks are the people who have families, have obligations. And so it's hard for them to recruit from their natural networks. So that's kind of exacerbating things. Um, and Beverly was in our group and she had started talking about that she's had some success recruiting from uh, with military and with college prep high schools. Um, I, we didn't get a chance to talk about it. I know that our minimum age for full volunteers is 19. So that kind of is an issue sometimes with high schools. Um, and I didn't get a chance to ask Beverly about with military, like for instance, we have a full week camp. So sometimes it can be hard for them to get that time off too. So we didn't get a chance to get into that. Uh, yes, if only, if only we had more time to be able to explore. Uh, Dr. Mike and Jennifer, uh, what else could you add to this conversation? Just, you know, I, I love hearing these model practices that that uh, organizations are exploring and seeing the value uh, of stretching beyond their traditional. So what more would you add? I think that um, it, the, the story about Beverly talking about uh, military volunteers reminds me of something that happened to us. It was in the past and we haven't been able to replicate it. But for many years, we had a, a guy who was um, serving uh, in the military as an airline mechanic at Travis Air Force Base, which is in the catchment area for our camp. And he came up for the entire summer to be our archery instructor. And his commander just had us send the dates that we needed him. And they sent him off to do that as part of his responsibility. So that was a great uh, setup that uh, lasted for quite a while. And uh, I've seen at Beverly's camp, she has a lot of the um, uh, military people doing those sort of special activities. They teach the you know, the shooting range or the archery range or some of the ropes events and things like that. Um, uh, so that 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 definitely was uh, something that was of interest in the comment that she made. I think the male staff uh, have always been a problem and that it was maybe exacerbated only because the numbers were stretched even thinner um, when we came back from COVID. COVID has upset a lot of things. It's going to continue to upset things for quite a while for different reasons in different age groups. Um, but I think that was a problem that definitely pre-existed uh, COVID. And partly it has to do with how men and women perceive what they should be doing in the world. And so that intrinsic motivation, we've got to find some way of training our men uh, to think outside of the traditional male role box a little bit more effectively. Yeah, you know, and again, a, a beautiful segue because a recent reading for me, and I, I love to share with others whenever I stumble upon some some reading that uh, I find insightful because I do work with college age men. I wanted to understand the world in which they live through research. So if you can see this, it's a book that's titled The Coddling of the American Mind. And uh, I've just been fascinated by this because uh, basically what, what this book is telling me is as much as your camps may need males, the males of American society need your camps too. And they need to play these roles, just as, as, as Dr. Mike had said, 
our, our, our young men in this country are trying to figure out what their actual role is in society. And, and I agree, I would love to see that, uh, that role continue to evolve and open up in different ways. It's just beginning to, uh, but yet uh, our young men are struggling right now. And I do believe that being able to serve in, in a meaningful way can be part of their journey of, of defining uh, their role in society. So I, again, I just applaud all of you for your openness to it. I was so pleased to see that data, eight unique mentions of the value of including men in this experience. And it may be for pure logistics reasons, but please recognize that you're having an impact on society and those men as well, especially young men. So I just wanted to take the, take the opportunity to reinforce that. We do have, uh, we have 10 minutes left and we have still two more categories to, to touch upon. So we'll do so quickly. Survey insights, category number six, I labeled personal and I really just wanted to call out this first line, 20 unique mentions of mental health. And Jennifer, I know that you and I had a conversation about this. So to the, to, to the degree that you can recall what we touched upon, but what do you remember from our chat just talking about how many times a mention of mental health came up in the survey data? Yeah, just in talking with the camps, um, uh, we actually had a meeting with our region directors within the COCA board to understand more some of the challenges that they had with volunteers this summer. And several of them explained to us that they felt like they had to handhold some of their volunteers a little bit more in um, the direction of their uh, volunteer duties. Um, there was a lot more drama, even from staff that they normally don't have drama from and, and, um, which was, uh, kind of odd and out of place for them to have to deal with as, um, camp directors or leaders of their organization. And, um, just, you know, baggage, bring in, bring in their personal baggage to camp and, you know, a lot of our camps do a really good job when training their staff about, you know, the importance of leaving your your personal baggage at the camp door when you enter the cabin and remember, you know, why you're there is to forget about self and be willing to serve others. Um, so I think that they dealt with those kinds of issues more than ever before. Yeah, it, it is fascinating to me, uh, and, and I, I do not pretend to be an expert in this area, but what I thought I would do is I would reach out to a close personal friend of mine who is an expert in this area to gain some perspective, because my heart was telling me that this, this new found embrace, and, and thank goodness we're getting there as a society where we're finally getting comfortable with including mental health and speaking of it in an open way. Uh, it, it was once so taboo in society, but yet now we're, we're getting to a comfort level. And, and this is a good thing, a good thing for us uh, in growing in this direction as a society. But uh, my, my friend, my friend Lizeth said that What's happening as a result of this comfort level is that we're throwing the words around in a, a somewhat wanton way at times, and we're labeling a lot of different things that, that could be on a broad spectrum as a, a mental health concern. Uh, one, one example that comes to mind, and I, I hear young people say this, is you know they'll, they'll hear a, a comment that's made and they say, I feel attacked. Uh, and, and I know it, it's usually said in jest, but but I, I sometimes wonder, is like, were you really attacked or do you just feel maybe just a smidge uncomfortable in that moment? So that might be one end of the spectrum, of course, honoring at the other end of that spectrum, true uh, mental health concerns. So we just just recognize that there is this spectrum of, of mental health, anything from slight discomfort to, to serious clinical concerns. So just be aware as we're hearing that term that uh, it sometimes calls for us to dig in a little bit deeper to understand where on that spectrum we may be exploring. But, but 
Jennifer, here's what I recall from our conversation. I recall it only because I took really good notes from our conversation, that uh, the people who, who walk alongside our missions, they don't need to be perfect. They don't need to have all the answers, but we do want them to be and, and help them to build the skill of becoming a more effective listener, a, a caring heart. And, and, and I talk about this with the young men who I work closely with is that, you know, communities, communities of people, when you know that somebody cares about you, they, they almost function as a form of triage. And they allow us to keep any sort of concerns and, and anxieties that we may experience at a lower level, because we know that somebody's there. We know that somebody is ready to listen. We know that somebody cares about us. And, and that is immeasurable in our ability to be able to, to maintain our balance in our lives. And furthermore, here's what I believe is that I believe that staff and volunteer experiences, they can be a significant part of what I call a journey to resilience. In other words, what does not kill us makes us stronger uh, in this case, and, and sometimes those uncomfortable moments, I can only imagine the uh, the heart uh, the heart wrenching moments that that I'm sure that many of you face in your roles on a regular basis. That uh, they become part of what makes you stronger. So it's part of your journey to resilience, and and I encourage us to encourage those who who do volunteer staff and volunteers to to consider how they can step into the, those stimuli instead of seeking to avoid the stimuli and embrace that it is part of our growth. It's part of our, our development opportunities to make us stronger and, and better prepared for what life offers. So again, uh, as I just put out those thoughts, uh, Dr. Mike, uh, Jennifer, thoughts, thoughts to add to, to that notion. Well, I think that that concept, which in my head is sort of, um, intentionally trying to grow your volunteers into roles of greater responsibility. And that I think that's something that uh, camps who do that well are really providing a substantial benefits to those volunteers because they're learning things about how life works and many of those skills might apply to different job settings. And uh, so I think that's one of the things we always keep on the top of our list of, of how it's part of engagement of the volunteers over the longer term as well, to just encourage them to continue to grow as a person and as a staff member into areas of, of greater responsibility. Yeah, yeah and, and this book has reinforced for me a, a notion, a, a trend that I, I thought that I, I had been seeing is that uh, life for many of our younger people uh, it is a, a safety net is provided for nearly all circumstances, uh, but yet with the work that you do, it's real life. This is real life stuff and being exposed to real life stuff, uh, it, it does uh, help us to, to grow and to be prepared. I, I talk about this so much with college age young men to just say, hey, uh, explore when the stakes are low because when, when you're entering the next phase of your life, the stakes go up, the stakes go up and they become much more real. So, so being able to, to expose ourselves and build up our, our callus a little bit and, uh, and to recognize that, uh, that fully living into those emotions, it's good, it's good and it's healthy. Yeah. So, and the other side of that as well is that the camp community can become a real important community of support for people. So if you're doing a good job of engaging and connecting your volunteers and they feel like they're contributing something um, as a team member, then that also is really helpful. And the social isolation of COVID may have disrupted that process. Uh, it's, it's not that it may have. I, I agree with you. I, I think it absolutely has. And, and we, we must always keep that uh, in our hearts and recognize that we are playing a bit of that catch up. And, and especially as we serve uh, populations who, who had, who experienced that two plus year time frame during a really formative stage of their life. So just a quick note, my clock says we have about two minutes left. If you can hang out for about a five minute span total, if we can leap just past the top of the hour, I'd love to just touch on uh, the seventh 
of our categories, which is marketing and communication, honoring that uh, there were 12 unique mentions specific to marketing communication and also access to hospitals and clinics, recognizing that COVID has obviously changed that for some. I was on the, the campus of St. Jude in Memphis about a month or so ago, and all they could talk about was how they used to do tours of the ward pre-COVID, but yet even now it's post-COVID-ish that they no longer do that and they do not anticipate going back to that former practice. So again, that was a reinforcement of the data that I was seeing here. And the last question that was in the survey was recommendations and strategies. And they fell into these beautiful categories of who and where, and then also how, and then the last one I labeled, why not? Because they're really just explorations of your own culture, your own philosophies, uh, the own ten your own tenets that your organization holds. And I loved to see that the top two uh, recommendations for where you find volunteers were college students and, and friends, friends of volunteers or word of mouth. Uh, just a, a reinforcement, because this re uh, this brings the the concepts of intrinsic and et extrinsic motivation back into our conversation. I will share with you that if you're recruiting college students, and those college students are in some way affiliated with an organization or a club, that you may be able to expand your reach really quickly uh, and only because you can, you can reach multiple people within an organization. And keep in mind that as you do that, that they will bring with them two different sets of intrinsic motivators. One set is their personal intrinsic motivation and the other one could actually be a mix of their intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. It's the one that they bring along with their affiliation with that organization or that club. It's likely that they're trying to achieve something on behalf of that organization or club as well. So never hesitate to ask the questions of what they're seeking to get out of the experience in the hopes that you can create this symbiotic uh, relationship that's that's a give give more so than a give and receive. So I put this out there uh, just an opportunity for us to be able to share any closing thoughts from any of our participants. But anything that we talked about, uh, maybe an epiphany, maybe a thought, maybe a model practice that you heard, something new, something reinforced that's not new. What would you share to close us out? Well, I have an I, I have concept, but <clears throat> I'm a little bit on the radical side. So organizations that purport to be serving childhood cancer, like the Optimist Club or actually Amazon, their thing is childhood cancer, right? Their break rooms are all filled with gold balloons and gold things. And I'm like, so someone just so holding people accountable in your areas, but also those people don't always know, or those organizations don't know that you exist and that this is the population you serve. So um, yeah, I think the Lions Club also added childhood cancer to their national, international, um, you know, Hyundai, uh, the car manufacturer, childhood cancer. So all these organizations that use bald head kids to promote their whatever, you know, like hold them accountable to do something local and not just send all their thoughts and ideas to St. Jude's. Beverly, I like your bold take. Absolutely. Why well, that not? was the nice version. <laughs> <laughs> I was sensing that. Yeah, so yeah, what stops us? What stops us from approaching them and saying that or at, the, at the corporate level, you have stated that this is something that's important to you. Uh, I'm curious who within your organization also has a passion around this, would love to be able to engage them in meaningful ways and, and be able to leverage their gifts. So yeah, I, I'm with you, I hear you. Jennifer, Dr. Mike, what else would you share to close us out in our conversation today? 
I think from my own personal perspective, um, in my experience, one of the most important ways that we developed our staff was that sense of community and belonging and engagement over time, that recruiting is a whole different game and you need to go out to as many different people, as many different contexts as you can find, figure out who their connections are and lots of different ways you can do that. But once you get someone to volunteer, they become an incredibly valuable part of your toolbox the longer they stay. They learn more, they grow into new roles, they have a credibility with the campers and the staff, and in their own personal uh, sort of community as well, family and friends, uh, they can recruit other people to come and join you. So I think um, I see that part of it, the engagement part, the community building part, um, as over the long term, the more important part. And we all scramble to recruit from wherever we can, but we can build on our success by making sure they stay engaged and involved and feel committed and, and like they are a part of something important. Ooh, and, and, and that last point, it, making them feel, including them in such a way that they feel like they're part of something important, that they're more than just free hands but yet they're, they're making a valued contribution in a way that brings meaning and significance and fulfillment to them. Absolutely. And, and I'm going to add to your point, Dr. Mike, that what brings a volunteer or a staff member in the door at the beginning, their original intrinsic motivation, it rarely remains constant over their sustained engagement. Uh, that intrinsic motivation tends to evolve over time. And there's there's really no, no uh, magic way to find out. Uh, it is good old fashioned conversations. Sitting down with those who are serving alongside our mission and finding out, hey, I, I noticed that you came back again this year. We're so grateful to have your gifts here with us. I want to know your why. Would love to hear what is it that brought you back? What was it about your past experience that was so meaningful to you that you chose to again give your time and your talents? And being able to have those meaningful, ongoing conversations that tap into their intrinsic motivation. And Jennifer, what else would you add to close this out? Uh, I was just thinking about how we encourage our volunteers on that first day of camp to really get to know their campers, you know. What's their dog's name? What's their favorite color? What do they like to eat when they come at camp? To come to camp? What is their favorite activity? I mean, it's those kinds of things how that help us learn about our campers. So, you know, why aren't we diving in deeper to learn more about our volunteers? You know, what do they like? And you know, what did bring them back? And and you know, what is what ro new role do you see yourself doing at camp this year to help you? Um, you know grow yourself as a person because, you know, we're not just investing in the campers, we're investing in the volunteers because camp is a community, it's a family. And, um, you know, we we love each other and, and want to support one another. And I think the best way to do that is not just support the campers, but to support the volunteers too in that effort. With, with no doubt, that was really the genesis of, uh, of my work over the last eight or nine years. So uh, so we're happy to hear that we are kindred spirits in that respect. And, and here's what I noticed, and, and I'm going to use this as my closing point, is in the why not category, that program flexibility only garnered one mention and discovering or emphasizing the why of those who are choosing to serve through your mission only garnered one mention as well under recommendations and strategies, I would encourage those numbers to go up to honor that program flexibility in this post pandemic era, era, it may be what's called for. And also just those meaningful, significant conversations, honoring what's going on inside the heart of, uh, of those who are choosing to serve that's really where the magic is. And, and here's something I, I deeply believe is that engagement, it happens one person at a time. 
So with that, uh, I turn it back over to uh, to Callie and to Dr. Mike and to, and to Jennifer. I am absolutely honored to be able to spend this day with all of you in learning. Thank you. Barry, thank you. We really appreciate you being here today and helping us and walking us through the survey results and helping us understand what the numbers mean. And Dr. Mike, I appreciate you as always with your uh, valuable insights and and thoughts and uh, around these important subjects. And I appreciate each of you, you know, being being here today and being a part of this conversation. And if there's something that you think that COCA can assist you with in regards to this subject or anything else, please let us know. And um, I hope to see you in Chicago. That's my shameless plug for COCA-Con, November 9th through the 11th. Be there, be square. <laughs> Thanks everybody. I'm sure we'll have the time there to talk more about all of this. Thank you all. Did we lose Barry? It looks like. I guess we did. <laughs>